I don't know if you guys have noticed these blueberries sitting up on my pulpit. One of our members was over in Michigan and has made it tradition to pick lots of blueberries. Now on this particular Sunday, as we think about feeding the 5,000, well, it seems like there's a lot of symbolization going on at this moment. In different times, I'd pass this bag around and allow each of you to take one blueberry and squish it in your mouth and taste the sweetness of a Michigan blueberry. For now, you're going to have to use your imagination or go to Jules after church. <laughs> but you won't be getting these. <laughs> so it is good to be with you all again today. I'm going to encourage my young people sitting in the back to disattach themselves from their devices if they're on devices. I'm going to ask that you guys put those devices down for 30 minutes. Thank you. I'm going to ask for support from family members as well. I need you guys here with me. So the sermonic theme this morning is the miracle worker. The miracle worker. You probably can use your imagination and get down the street a little bit. We're talking about feeding 5,000 people in Jesus and amongst them. Huh, miracle worker. So in 1887, that's a minute ago, Helen was born in Tuscumba. I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but I'm trying, Alabama. She was the youngest of five siblings to a slaveholding daddy who fought as a Confederate soldier in the Civil War. Her mother was the daughter of a Confederate general. After the Civil War, they would lose their status. But prior to this loss in her family, this financial loss, Helen would suffer another loss. She con contracted an illness the doctors described as acute congestion of the stomach and brain. This illness left her blind and unable to hear. Either one of these would have been a great tragedy, but to both not be able to hear and not be able to see pulls one south beyond Alabama. As time went on, she was able to communicate with the two-year-old daughter of the family cook. And by the time she was seven years old, she had 60 homemade signs to communicate with her family. Her mother one day was reading a book and she read about this other blind and deaf child being educated and she began to have hope for her daughter. They sent her to the same school. This girl had been educated up in Boston where the other girl had been educated. And her teacher, her teacher's name was Ann Sullivan. You're probably recognizing this by now. And Ann Sullivan would spell words in her hand and then place the object in Helen's hand. Helen grew very frustrated because see, Helen did not know that every item had a word. She didn't understand that in her world. And so she grew frustrated with this teacher and she started spelling the words back, but she didn't realize what she was doing until one day the teacher took her and poured water over her hand and spelled water in her hand. It was on that day that Helen made the connection that this spelling in my hand and this water that I'm feeling are connected. Helen said in her memoir, I knew then that water meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. The living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, and set it free. Well, Helen began to run to all sorts of items and ask how to spell them because she understood. Mark Twain was so impressed with Helen that he called her teacher, Miss Sullivan, a miracle worker. Here this lady had been able to reach beyond her ability to see or hear. Her and her teacher would continue their relationship for 50 more years. The miracle worker. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jesus was really getting the good news out. His crowd was growing and growing and growing. This day was no different. He had gone over to the other side and the crowds were following him. They were thirsty and they were hungry for what he was doing and what he was saying. Jesus kept it 100% real and he did not dummy down the message. And more and more people were drawn to what Jesus was saying. And he announces to his crew the need to feed these people, which by now had become about 5,000 people. One disciple notes there, there is one amongst us with two fish and five loaves. Not hardly enough for this size crowd. 
Jesus took what the boy had, and Jesus gave thanks, and then distributed, and the whole crowd, the text tells us, ate. And the whole crowd ate, and their stomachs were content. They wanted to make him king. You could say Jesus was really, really a miracle worker. During COVID, my family began to listen to the number one ladies detective agency by Alexander McCall. The setting is in Botswana, Africa. So this past Friday, as we were watching the opening ceremony to the Olympics, we were looking for Botswana to walk in any moment because we wanted to see what the people from Botswana look like. And we waited and we waited. During that intense time last year, do you remember where we were asked to isolate and be in our homes and literally not be around other people? We would get in our car and crank the heat up and cut on volumes of the number one ladies detective. There are 20 books about all that span from 1998 all the way up to 2020. And this summer, we completed them all. We came to know the characters, especially the main character, I still can't say her name too well, and her values and her virtue and about the people and the life and the kind of feeling of Botswana. The then people, the now people, the old school, the new school people, their culture. Similarly, in this text today, the people had come to know the work of Jesus Christ. They had been following Jesus for a while and listening to Jesus, and they heard Jesus, and they were now there because they knew his volumes of work. They knew about his miracles, and they knew him to be a miracle worker. Miracles are all about the expansion of our ability to see. While on vacation, we went to Lookout Mountain, and when we started up the hill, we were in Tennessee. But by the time we got to the top of the mountain, we were in Georgia. And by the time we talked all the way out to the point, they told us that we could see seven states. Now, my cynical side, are there any other people in here that are cynical beside me? My cynical side started popping up and say, how can you see seven states at one time, please? Okay, so I really got into it, but 25 miles away, you can see three states, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia. Now let's talk about the remaining four of the seven states. North Carolina is 50 miles away, okay, okay. South Carolina is 80 miles away and Kentucky and Virginia are 120 miles away. And on a clear day and with a good pair of binoculars, I guess maybe you can see all seven states. But this isn't about how far you can see. It's not about seeing all seven states. It's about how far our faith allows us to see. The disciples were like right away perplexed with the task. You know we are broke. You know we travel by foot from one place to the next, open to whomever chooses to feed us. You know 5,000 is a lot of folks to feed. 50 would have been too lot. Okay, we got two fish and five loaves. That can't even feed us. So Jesus, what are you talking about? Why do you keep doing this to us? They had an eyesight problem. They didn't see how they could possibly feed 5,000 people. One of my friends is losing her sight. It shocked me when she first told me. I was asking her to drive somewhere, and she didn't want to drive there because she was like, you know, my sight is not that good. And she won't go to the doctor, which I find really, you know, some people, when they get bad news or they feel bad news, they just won't go to the doctor. They won't confront it. She's going to ride this out as long as she can, and she's already accepted she won't pass her next driving test and she's going to just stay close to home and drive in the daytime and drive for as long as she can and i have pushed because that's one of my ministries pushing people and so i push her but she's not edging she's like that rusted nail in your house that rusted screwdriver you just can't get her cranked you can't get her loose and i think today she's not the only one losing sight i think the church and the people of god in it sometimes we've lost our eyesight We've lost our vision. It was certainly true of the disciples. We are so busy seeing what we don't have and all the complications that we are unable to see what we do have. And we get stuck on what we can't possibly do. One of the greatest challenges to the church is not the finances, it's the naysayers. It's the negativity. Folks with limited vision and eyesight problems. And we miss the miracle that's right before us. 
after the New Orleans Dam was busy, the, the, after, the, after the New Orleans Dam broke, there was this man that prayed to Jesus. You've heard this corny joke. He prayed to Jesus, and the water got higher, and a guy in a Jeep came by and said, hey, man, you need help? He's like, no, no, I'm good. I'm waiting on Jesus. The water gets a little bit, little bit higher, and a person comes along in a boat, and he says, hey, let me rescue you. And he's like, no, 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 you go rescue someone else. I'm waiting on Jesus. Finally, the water's high. He goes up into the second floor of his house. A helicopter comes, and he still says, no, I'm waiting. I'm going to wait this one on Jesus. You go ahead and get somebody else. And so he dies, and he goes to heaven. He says, Jesus, why? Why didn't you rescue me? And Jesus is like, I sent the Jeep. <laughs> I sent the boat. I sent the helicopter. <sighs> Sometimes I think it's challenging for us to see because we are focused on the problem. We're focused on the water. We're focused on the locked door. We're focused on the bills. And we take our eyes off the thing that matters, which is Jesus, our miracle worker. Yesterday at Jesse Bradford's memorial picnic, it was, it was hotter than it is today. <laughs> and I was sweating more yesterday than I was today. And someone passed out, perhaps from the heat. And I, I did a check in the person's home. They've been released. They got released yesterday. But when this incident happened, I mean, the crowd was a miracle. One person called the ambulance, and another person evacuated out and asked us to give the person room to breathe. And the saints began to pray left and right, and there were more and more people on the ground keeping him coherent and putting ice on his neck. And I mean, I thought to have that many people praying for you when you pass out. It was like we became a trauma center. And I thought, what a miracle to have 50 people focused on your well-being. When our clitch and close at some point, we recognized we still wanted to feed people. And even though we wanted to stay at home and be safe, we still wanted to feed. We still wanted to speak to the hunger in people's lives. And then another church who had partnered with another church that made sandwiches for the night ministry, well, one of the churches bailed on them. And they reached out to us. And we were wanting to do something that spoke to hunger. And so they reached out to us, and we said yes. And it's not 5,000 people, but we make 200 sandwiches once a month. And those sandwiches are good. We got Laura baking cookies, and we got the best deli meat. It's so good that one of my members went out and bought some more. And we smacked some mayonnaise and Miracle Whip up on them. I'm telling you. And we put lots of prayer and love in those bags. And we send them out into the world to those who are hungry for hope, who literally have hunger in their belly. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Miracles happen today, but we need eyes to see them. It's not that the miracles are not happening. Not everyone will see them. And Jesus tells the people that not everyone will see, not everyone will understand, but some will see, and some of you can see God's miracles. Today, I'm challenging you to see the miracles that are right before you. Jesus is throwing resources to our church. I'm not talking about another church. I'm talking about United Church of High Park. We've been thrown so many resources. Jesus is giving us opportunities to be active in our community. We have another town hall meeting coming up this Saturday where we're talking about the problems on our lawn, but we're talking to our community and we're inviting people in and we're having a conversation. And I need every one of you to invite someone. I don't need you just to come. I need you to invite someone else to come this Saturday at 10 a.m. Jesus is bringing people to our church and that's exciting. And sometimes we can focus on the problems and we can miss the miracle. We have a daycare coming, and hats off to all the folks that are working, and it's taking a lot, and that's a miracle. We are being asked to change and shift and to give up some of our conveniences, and sometimes we get stuck on, I want it this way. But our building is big enough for us to find other spaces to do ministry in it. It's big. Don't miss the miracle because you're lost in the problem. Miracles happen even today. So here was Jesus on another day getting closer to his departure, sharing good news with the people of God. By this time, Jesus didn't see crowds. He didn't seek them out, but they came to him. They wanted to hear more of what he was saying. They wanted to see more miracles, and they followed him around like the grateful dead cronies. They just wanted to be near him. And Jesus is like, we have to feed them today, physical food. 
And Jesus was not expected to feed the 5,000, but he responded to a need. And all they had was two fish and five loaves of bread. He simply used what he had, and that's all God asked of us. Use what you got. You got a voice, speak out against bigotry. You got hands, hold a baby or make some sandwiches. You got legs, join a march. You got a heart, use it to do good in the world. You got money, share it. And so Jesus used what he had, two fish and five loaves. He lets what the disciples think have air, but he doesn't give it oxygen. Jesus shows them, and maybe you can too, see it. Or maybe you're trying to rationalize and explain that actually he fed the 5,000. Maybe you're stuck within the confines of your own limited thinking. Or maybe like the crowds gather, you can see the possibilities that are present in Christ Jesus. He's more than wonderful. He's more than wonderful. Christ frees us from the mindset of scarcity if we want to be freed. Today, as the music plays, that's a cue too, I want you all to think about not the miracles you need, not the miracles you like to see, but the miracles that have already happened to you. Think about the possibilities that are right in front of you. Think about what you have that you can offer up if you haven't already in response to the needs that are present in our world today. Think about how God has shown up for you. You can even jot them down if you want. I'm not going to ask you guys a question today, but I am inviting you while the music plays to reflect on what Jesus has done around and in your life. I'm inviting you to reflect on the miracle worker. Amen.